Hello everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm recording in Reykjavik, Iceland as always, and today we've got snow showers outside, it is below zero, it's cold but it's a bright spring day. Um, I've been playing a bunch of different video games this week, I'm going to talk about some of them today. Um, I started off a Metroidvania called Pronti, which is pretty cool on the Switch. I've been continuing to play a little bit of Hi-Fi Rush, the cartoon rhythm game that has been taking the world by storm since it was snap released earlier this year. And I've got a few more to talk about as well, but the main game that I'm going to talk about this week is actually an old game. It's a bit of a retro one, and I played this one just um, on spec. I wasn't planning to play it, I just, um, I just got in the mood for it, downloaded it to my Switch, finished it in one day. It's a game that I love from back in the day, and it is the Panzer Dragoon remake that came out in 2020 on the Switch and on all the consoles, so it's a a reworking of a classic game. Well, classic to some, we'll get to that, Um, and I thought it was worth talking about today. It's an interesting game with an interesting place in history, and I've got a little bit of history with that game as well. I've played it before um, back in the old days. I played the original version and was very impressed by it. So it was nice to see it back again. And it sounds like we've got more Panzer Dragoons coming down the pike as well. Um, But to start off with, uh, Pronti, I've mentioned it before. It was one of the games that I talked about in my uh, indie preview of 2023. Uh, This is an underwater Metroidvania, um, and that is a genre that I low-key love. Um, I think of one game called Shinsekai Into the Depths that is available on Apple Arcade and on Switch that I think was a little overlooked. But I loved it. I really loved it. I I like Metroidvania games as a whole, where you explore, you power up, you get new abilities. Um, There's something about them that's just like a comfort food genre of gaming. I also really like good traversal and feeling free in games. And so when you're underwater, um, obviously you're swimming around, um, you can jet through the water. The movement can feel very nice, and it does in Pronti. So um, I was kind of into this one just from seeing a video of it, um, but it's a it's an indie game. I haven't heard of the team before, um, and so, you know, it was a hit or miss choice. Um, I've only played an hour of it, but the early impressions that I have have been really positive, actually. It has a twin-stick shooter element that I wasn't quite expecting, so you control Pronti, who's like a little uh, guardian robot, but looks more like a little pink octopus person, um, maybe a little bit like... The, the modern incarnations of the Zora prints in uh, Breath of the Wild. Um, and Pronti has to swim through um, a series of underwater tunnels, um, forgotten cities, all of that sort of stuff, exploring. Um, there is a story there for you. It has this twin stick mechanic where you use the right stick to aim um, and fire with a shoulder button. So you can move, aim, and shoot all at the same time. Uh, boost is on L2. So you can be avoiding and boosting Uh, and shooting all at the same time. And the control scheme felt um, really, really good, actually. I took to it like a duck to water. Um, You can also dash through enemies, and that will then mark them. And when you hit um, fire, the the swordfish that you are swimming around with, who's your little pal in this game, also acts as your main weapon. And if you have marked an enemy by dashing through it, using your iframes, it will be marked. Um, You don't have to aim at it at that point. If you hit the fire button your swordfish will shoot straight into it. So there's a really great uh, lock-on marking system. Um, And I'm I'm kind of looking forward to playing more of Pronti. I just uh, tried it out this morning uh, just to talk about it on the show and and ended up playing it for quite a while. Uh, Really nice little game. Love the movement, like the art style. Um, I'm hoping that it holds up. These games can get a little tricky. Um, Some of the video that I've seen of Pronti suggests that that will be the case here too. Uh, But so far, the control scheme and the movement and the combat all feel very good. So, good first signs for Pronti. I also played a little bit more Hi-Fi Rush this week. I picked up a pair of speakers this week. I treated myself to a pair of speakers for my Xbox and my my computer monitor setup. Some Mackie monitors. Um, And I thought, what better game to play than Hi-Fi Rush just to test them out. Um, as it is a music-led rhythm game, so I blasted up the speakers and went into Hi-Fi Rush. This is a game that the world is very enamoured with since it was released earlier this year. Um, I played the first hour of it and just kind of bounced on it. I wasn't feeling the the vibe of the whole thing. 
Um, but I came back to it, gave it a second swing, and I had mixed results this time. I had some ups and downs with it. I think when you are in the flow of combat in Hi-Fi Rush, when you're hitting all your combos, um, and you're just flying through the game quite rapidly, it can be really, really satisfying, kind of invigorating, exciting. Um, there's a constant music going, the rhythm of the world just uh, sort of pulsing in the screen. Very, very, very cool. Um, however, there are a bunch of hiccups, um, both in gameplay and in the, I would say, in the overall tone of this game, um, that have not enamored it to me personally. I think that the platforming in this game is super lackluster, and what you're really doing is platforming through linear levels with um, very, very samey combat arenas. Um, they all look the same. They're like these little square or round uh, combat arenas, all of similar size, all of similar decor, even from the tutorial through to where I am, which is halfway through the game. Um, all of the combat arenas have basically looked the same. Um, you get different combinations of enemies that you can take down. Uh, they have shields that you have to break. There is different kinds of evasion that is required. And when it's firing on all cylinders, the combat is incredibly fun. Uh, you get marked on your um, accuracy on the beat. Uh, you get marked on the time that it took you to clear a room. Um, I was getting S on all of the times, and I was getting A's and B's on all of the rhythm stuff. So have been able to wrap my head around the rhythm combat. I think it's very forgiving. Um, and when it's firing on all cylinders, it's very good. But that is only one part of the game. There is also a story. It has these kind of cartoon cutscenes. Uh, your, your main character is a really unlikable, unpleasant, arrogant, cocky, uh, wannabe rock star guy who I, I actually like hate. He's like an empty, cool guy caricature. I cannot stand him, which does not help. I like to identify with my protagonists. Um, that's why I love games like Horizon, Control. It's why I can't connect with some games like Witcher. Um, I don't really get Geralt as just, just this gruff guy. And I don't really get Chai, the hero of Hi-Fi Rush. I just do not um, want to be them, which I think is a problem in a character game. And this is a character action game. Um, I also think that the music is um, its kind of incessant, uh, bland FM rock sound, like a Marshall Stack, uh, Wayne's world -y kind of backing track um, and it's at the same tempo throughout the entire game, which is great for gameplay because you get used to that tempo, but it's bad for variety because you start to feel like you've been on hold for a long time after a while playing the game. Um, there is also a parrying mechanic that um, I've really struggled with the timing for. Um, so there have been moments of real enjoyment, but equal amounts of moments of eye-rolling frustration and overall annoyance with the tone, the characters, the writing. Um, it's a very brash, bright, gaudy game, um, and it can be really fun. But, I mean, even in small doses, I've had to sort of do half a level, take a break, because um, it's doing my head in, and then come back to it and finish a level off. So, Hi-Fi Rush, ups and downs. Like, I can see why people like it, but it's kind of not speaking to me somehow. But I am going to try and persist with it. I'm halfway through now, and it's only, I think, a nine-hour game or something. So maybe I will just do little sessions here and there um, and see if the, the final, see if it sticks the landing, see if it can get me by the end of the game. Um, I also played a little bit more Dredge. This game is still on, um, <laughs> on embargo, so even though a few people have started to talk about it out in the media, I guess because there is quite a, lo a long demo, um, so it's out in the wild, um, it is under embargo, and I do like to respect the embargo, um, but Dredge is that Lovecraftian fishing game, like a little mini open world, where you take your little tugboat, your little fishing boat, and you go bobbing across the waves. Um, at night, strange things come out and come for you. Um, when you come into dock, it has a menu system where you can repair your boat, sell your fish, get story missions. Um, there is a map with markers that show you where to go. Each area has a cool new um, topography in the islands, um, different fish, different weather effects. And there is a story about all of this forgotten stuff that is sunk below the waves that you are dredging up. Um, this is a really, really good game. I will say that much. Um, I'm looking forward to talking about it when the embargo finally lifts, uh, which I believe is the 23rd. So I will aim to get a Dredge podcast out on the 23rd or soon after. Um, I also got codes and cashed them in. So I have Storyteller ready to go on my Switch. Really excited about that one. And I have The Forest Cathedral ready to go on the Xbox. So lots of good things that I've played this week. Lots of good things coming up.
And just before we get on to the featured review, the Panzer Dragoon remake review, um, I would like to say thank you to the show's newest patron supporter, Ai Henpai, who joined only this morning on the dollar tier. Um, they got access immediately to nine bonus episodes of the podcast about music and travel and different kinds of things. They also came and joined the Discord to join the, uh, the Gaming in the Wild Discord gang, uh, where there is a single sitting club a game club where we play short games together. There are Wordle channels, Guess the Game channels. There is a Fantasy Critic League. Um, There is a very busy Chained Echoes channel. People are still talking about Chained Echoes. It came out in December, and three months later, people are still going nuts about that in our Discord. That is a popular game in uh, Gaming in the Wild Discord. Uh, There is also a channel for Hi-Fi Rush. There is a channel for Pentiment. Um, We swap them out when new games come out that everyone is into. So I think that some of those... uh, games of the moment channels will be changing soon Um, but you're welcome to come and join that discord to talk to us to take part in all of that fun stuff it's patreon.com slash gaming in the wild if you're interested in that thanks very much to i henpai for joining up Um, and thank you very much to you if that's something that you would consider and with that said let's move on to the featured review of this episode it's time to talk about that panzer dragoon remake So Panzer Dragoon first came out in 1995 on the Sega Saturn. Um, I was around back then, still playing games, so I really wanted a a Saturn. Um, I will get to that in a bit. It was made by Team Andromeda, published by Sega. Um, It gave gave birth? Wait, that's not what I wanted to say. It didn't give birth. Um, It led to a series of games, so there are lots of uh, Panzer Dragoon games. I think they are pretty well known. They're they're quite impressive. They are dragon riding rail shooters uh, for the most part. Um, And they look great and they just kind of capture the imagination. It certainly stuck in my imagination. So I was very happy when we saw that there was a complete remake of the game. It it was just uh, snap released in a Nintendo Direct in the middle of 2020. Uh, The remake was done by Megapixel and published by Forever Entertainment. This is a Polish publisher that released an awful lot of games, not many of which I've heard of. I'm not sure if it is fair to call them a shovelware publisher, because I haven't played a lot of the games that I saw on their website, but it certainly looked like a lot of eShop clutter to me. Um, But they have the rights to Panzer Dragoon. They work with some in-house developers. Megapixel is one of those. Um, So they've remade the first Panzer Dragoon, and it seems like they're going to be working on more. The sequel, Panzer Dragoon Zwe, is already on the way. Um, And they say of this remake, a new remade version of the Panzer Dragoon game, true to the original, with improved graphics and controls that suit modern gaming standards. On a far planet, you encounter two dragons from ancient times. Armed with a deadly gun and the guidance of your armoured blue dragon, you must fulfil your destiny and keep the prototype dragon from reaching the tower. Um, That is an awful lot of word salad right there. Um, I say about this one, It's a classic Sega Saturn spectacle shooter that gets a welcome lick of paint in this remake for modern consoles. The gameplay is creaky but satisfying, and the visuals are bright and crisp. It's a welcome return for a nostalgic classic. Um, I don't know if it was a welcome return for everyone, though. Looking at Metacritic, the game tended to get between 6 and 7. Most of the people who reviewed it had played the original... There seemed to be a consensus that it has not aged well since it came out back in the mid-90s. So this game is almost 30 years old, and it is quite a faithful remake, even though the visuals have been built apparently from the ground up, as people like to say lately. Um, I did play this original back in the day. Um, I had a little bit of history with this one. Um, I thought it might be fun just to talk about that, talk about my own history with the Saturn and with Panzer Dragoon. Um, I remember when the Saturn was launched... I remember very distinctly that the the launch title for the Sega Saturn, or at least the one that they marketed and pushed in the UK, was Nights Into Dreams, that flying game where you play as a jester, um, a little bit like Sonic 
Uh, you're flying through rings. You're going fast. Um, it's a flow state game. Um, but you go in and out of the screen as well. Uh, it's like a 2.5D game where you do loop the loops for points. Um, you have to explore levels and that sort of thing. Um, and nothing like that had really been seen before at that time. And I was desperate to get a Sega Saturn. But at the age of 17, I, I didn't have that kind of cash just lying around. I think I already had a Super Nintendo Um and I didn't get a Sega Saturn, but I remember being in a department store and standing playing Nights into Dreams in an absolute trance and thinking that it was the most wonderful thing. Um, so I really wanted a Sega Saturn back in the day. I didn't get one. And then years later, back when I was living in London, I thought, you know what? I could get myself a Saturn now. I can look back on all those things that I wanted as a kid and as a teen, and they are now attainable. Um, and at that time, I would say in the, uh, the, the zero zeros and the teens of this millennium, um, the retro gaming kind of craze had not really taken off yet. I would say anything that was a generation or too old kind of became thrift store, car boot sale, junk, really. You could get consoles for not much money at all. Um, and old games were just these dusty, old, unwanted things. People did not collect. They upgraded and then they let go of their old stuff. Uh, maybe as people moved out of home and... Um, and, you know, ended up with a PlayStation. They just didn't want the Saturn anymore. And so I picked up a Saturn for, I think, £20 and just had it delivered from eBay. I uh, went through a bunch of lists for some of the best games from that time that I remembered. And I ended up getting a Saturn with Nights into Dreams, with Virtua Fighter, which I had played on uh, as an arcade game as a kid and as a teen, uh, with Daytona USA, with Sega Rally, and Panzer Dragoon. It was definitely, to me, one of the games that makes that bucket of really desirable Sega Saturn games. Um, and I played the shit out of those games. I had a really good time having a Saturn for the first time. Um, I will say, though, that it tended to be like a hungover Sunday kind of thing. Um, I would just fire up one of those games, play a few levels, and then forget about them again. Um, and by the time I actually left London and sold all of my consoles off just for, you know, uh, life laundry kind of reasons... I let go a lot of games without finishing them, um, and I do like to finish games where I can if I'm enjoying them. Um, so when Panzer Dragoon came out, I just got like a flood of nostalgia when I saw it on the screen again, bought it immediately for my Switch. Um, but the Sega Saturn's a very, a very charming console, and I have a real soft spot for it. I think it's second only to like the Nintendo consoles. Um, Saturn and Mega Drive and the Sega, the Sega consoles are like um, some of the most nostalgic consoles out there, I think. Um, there are also other Panzer Dragoon games, and I was so into this idea of just this, this beautiful idea of just flying through these rail shooters, taking stuff out with my dragon lasers, looking at all of the beautiful scenery flowing by. It has those 3D shoot 'em up kind of vibes. Um, but with a really, really nice art style and something something cool about them. There's just something cool about the Panzer Dragoon games. Um, I think I had Panzer Dragoon's Way as well, but I'm not sure I cracked it open. Um, I always wanted Panzer Dragoon Saga. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this game, but it's a three-disc Saturn classic that was released in the West with only a thousand physical copies. It sells for £300 used. It sells for £1,000 if it's unopened. Um, with only a thousand copies made. Uh, critics at the time said that Panzer Dragoon Saga should be considered alongside Final Fantasy VII, so it was considered to be one of the best RPGs ever made at that time. Um, but something that was like a halfway point with that one was that you could get a demo disc of it. Um, so I got a demo disc of Panzer Dragoon Saga on eBay. It was the first disc of the three disc games. So you could play quite a lot of it. Um, it's a bit more open-worldy. It's still quite linear, but you can land where you want to. You can get off your dragon. You can explore caves on foot. You can get back onto your dragon. Then there's combat. There's random combat encounters. So it was like um, a more ambitious take on what Panzer Dragoon could become. Um, it's a cult classic. I love it. I would love to play it one day. Um, I doubt that I will ever play the original on a Saturn, um, but maybe through emulation, something like that. You would think that a cult classic like that, that a lot of people want to play but can't afford and are curious about, might be an ideal candidate for a remake or a remaster. Um, but there's, there's been rumours from some of the creators of the game that the source code was lost, although Sega have denied that. So who knows? Um, if Forever Entertainment have got the rights to the Panzer Dragoon series, you never know. They're making Zway now. Just imagine uh, a remaster of Panzer Dragoon Saga. I think that would go wild um, with, with gamers, especially collectors. But to get back on topic, Panzer Dragoon is a dragon-riding, 
arcade style rails shooter where you are airborne. If you think of games like Afterburner, the classic flying arcade games um, from back in the day, it was like a, a, f- a high fantasy version of that. Um, you're on rails, so you're just flying into the screen. You can't control your speed, um, but you can move around a little to avoid incoming projectiles. There's like a little corridor of movement. It's quite tight, but there is a little bit of control there. Um, there are only six levels in this game. They all have very different scenery um, from overworlds to ocean to forest and jungle to city and so forth. Um, they only take about five minutes each to complete, um, and there are only six levels, so deaths and retries aside, you can get through this game in 40 minutes. Um, and I actually really like how concise it is. Um, it is also a game with replay value. Um, you get graded on each chapter based on your accuracy and whether or not you missed anything. So for people that like 100%ing things, this is a perfect candidate. It's a half-hour game that you can just rattle through, that you can get to know, and maybe it gets relaxing to try and uh, take out everything and get those 100%. Some people like to play that way. Um, I can see myself playing this one again if I'm on a flight and I just want something kind of mindless and fun and engaging. Um, Panzer Dragoon Remake ticks all of those boxes. Um, Info on the remake was pretty sparse. Uh, Forever Entertainment did not go into the kind of detail that we've become accustomed to um, in terms of uh, frame rates, in terms of upscaling, in terms of new models and textures. All of the talk that we've become a little bit used to from Dead Space Remake and all of those kind of things, um, none of that here. They just spat out that um, that description that I gave you at the start of the review. Um, so I had to mine a little bit and find... Um, some sites, some fan sites where people were talking about the game. Um, I got it confirmed from fans of the original that this one seems to have been remade from the ground up. Um, It has brighter, cleaner graphics. Um, It has difficulty options that were not present in the original. It has control options for a free camera. It has new cutscenes made in-engine rather than pre-rendered, so it looks a little more slick. The main criticism of it that I found in the the Panzer Dragoon fan community is that Zwei and Orta, the sequels, um, upgraded the controls a little bit. They introduced new elements. So the consensus seems to be that it is a solid but conservative remake. I think the fan community might have liked to see some of the advancements that were present in Zwei and Orta applied to the original to make it an updated version of the original rather than a completely clean remake as it is. But I'm sure that there is another contingent of fans who are just happy to be able to play this game on Switch and on modern hardware. I will give a shout out to the writer Solar Wing. They did a wonderful review of the game on PanzerDragoonLegacy.com. I will put a link to that in the description if you would like to read their very detailed look um, at what the remake does and doesn't do. I will say that as a player that hadn't picked it up for over a decade, maybe longer, um, it felt very much like the original to me. Um, I was a fan of the original back in the day, and I think there's a lot to like about it. I like that the the rails mechanic just means that you are almost on a ride through this quite wonderful looking kingdom. Um, The artwork has been really brightened up here, so it pops even more. Like um, you fly past architecture, you fly under bridges, you are zooming around through this really cool um, high fantasy sort of tech fantasy world, a little bit like uh, the Final Fantasy games. And flying a dragon and just blasting down enemies all around you it is just a winning formula, and I think that that remains true in this version. So the shooting gameplay is that you have a 3D reticle on the screen. Um, You can move it around to manually take on enemies uh, by whacking the button fast in an old shoot 'em up kind of style. Uh, The pilot will fire their laser gun when you do so. Um, There is also a secondary attack. This is the dragon's laser attack. And if you hold down the B button and strafe the screen, if the cursor, if the reticle passes over enemies, it will uh, lock onto them, a target will appear on them. So you can hold and drag across the screen, lock onto five enemies, and when you release, the dragon will fire out lasers that home in and usually take them out in one shot. 
Um, so that's a really cool pair of shooting mechanics. You can pepper the screen with low power shots, or you can try and use the dragon's laser. Um, both are really useful. Um, you are trying to clear the screen as quickly as possible. Enemies will travel onto the screen, sometimes in flocks or shoals. Sometimes they will jump out of sand or come down from the sky above you. Sometimes they are turret in placements built into cliff sides and so forth. So there's a lot of enemy variety, and they tend to appear a little bit before they attack you. So if you can take them out before they can target you and clear the screen as quickly and um, efficiently as possible, that is really the way to play the game. Um, the Dragon Laser is fantastic for that. If you see five ships coming in from the right, if you manage to lock onto all of them, they are immediately gone. It's very, very satisfying to clear the screen that way. Um, but if they do manage to turn towards you, and fire missiles or projectiles in your direction, you can often use the pilot's gun just to uh, pick off those missiles before they get to you. Um, if you do get hit, your dragon lets out a giant screech um, and your health goes down a little bit. Um, the lock-on is also really useful for identifying weak points on larger enemies. Um, if you hold down B and scan over like an airship, for example, you can see where the lock-ons appear and you know that that's the weak point so you can use it to kind of analyze enemies and uh, know what to shoot at with your pilot weapon as well. This is really useful for um, airships, for example. Um, if you see airships coming towards you, you can scan them and your uh, lock-on might tell you to aim at the, the balloons rather than the deck itself. Um, it might also tell you that you can lock onto some of the, the guns of the airship and take those out first to neuter its attacks. Um, enemies come from all sides, but you can only look in four directions um, this is the classic control scheme. There is a separate control scheme where you get free looking, uh, so you can free control the camera. Um, but that doesn't quite work. I think that the way that the, the waves of enemies are curated is very much set up for you to be using the 90 degree turns. You use the shoulder buttons to look left, look right, look behind you, and you can uh, move the camera clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, it's a little clunky, I have to say. Um, but compared to the free camera, I think the game was just built with that system in mind, and so I think that that is still the best way to play it. Um, some enemies weave around, so you have to move the camera to follow them, especially bosses uh, and bigger enemies. Um, so you have to move the camera and then wait for the enemy to come into shot to hit it again. It's a bit of a weird system. Um, it's a sign of the game's age. I think camera control is something of a solved issue at this point in time. But it was not when they made Panzer Dragoon, so there is a little bit of um, baggage that comes with the age of the game. Um, I am curious about whether people who have no nostalgia for Panzer Dragoon would get anything out of it at all. It might just feel like a very creaky old game. Um, I think there is a little bit of that childlike wonder in me um, that gives me this, this feeling of warm nostalgia and pleasure um, to be playing this game specifically. Um, I would say that it is primarily a spectacle shooter, um, so it's at its best when there are towers falling across your path, when you are just flying through closing doors like an X-Wing escaping from a, a Death Star, um, when there are large waves of enemies and you, you learn where they're coming from and you take them out really quickly. It's very satisfying. Um, and the boss fights are really cool too. Uh, you might get like an enemy um, airship station that shoots out other enemies at you, you might get the prototype dragon itself, which has various forms throughout the game and seems to stalk you as you move through this game. Um, the shooting is pretty satisfying, I would say. It's a little slippery. Um, it definitely harks back to the age of um, arcade machines. This game does feel like an arcade machine, um, which I think is a part of the nostalgia for me too. Playing the kind of game that, that looks and feels like the games you played in arcades as a kid and having that in the palm of your hand on the Switch Something very satisfying about that. It does also have other arcadey touches, like uh, when you clear a level, you get extra continues uh, based on how many times that you died. Um, I used a couple of continues, but I think I had four left when I completed the game. So um, from, from that review on PanzerDragoonLegacy.com, it sounds like the difficulty has been ameliorated a little bit. Um, there are difficulty modes, but it sounds like the normal difficulty has been made a little more progressive from level to level. So it gets more difficult rather than having more arbitrary spikes, which seemed to be one of the bugbears that people had about the original game. Um, so the continue system is really nice. If you die, you just have to try the level again. It certainly adds a sense of pressure. Um, if you only have a limited amount of continues before you have to start the entire game again, 
um, it does focus your mind a little bit on uh, really noticing where challenging enemies come from um, and establishing techniques to take them down before they take you down. Um, there are definitely a few uh, gauntlets of enemies coming at you from all sides where you have to prioritize which ones to take down, which ones are doing the most damage to you, or which ones you can take down the, the quickest, basically, to, to try and clear the screen a little bit. Um, so this is a very simple game, really. You only get those two weapons that you start with. There are no power-ups in this game, which were a real staple of the shoot-em-up genre. Um, but maybe this was, you know, it was the first-time director who made this game, age 25 at the time, um, a Japanese director who went on to make a lot of the sequels as well. Um, it does seem like at the time this might have been a technically demanding game for the Saturn. Um, apparently, from that review on PanzerDragoonLegacy.com as well, um, they've added in a lot of environmental detail. Um, so there's more piping on interiors, there's more detail on buildings, there's more flora and fauna that is visible to you as you're flying through this world. Um, but I am very curious because I don't think I ever played either of the sequels. Um, and so I'm very curious to see where they took the Panzer Dragoon concept. Um, Zwei remake is in production now. Um, I'm really, really hopeful that we see Panzer Dragoon Saga again one day. Um, I think the way to play it would definitely be a remaster rather than a ROM, especially because of things like key prompts or button prompts for a Saturn controller. If you're using something else with an emulator... Um, that can get a bit messy, as I discovered trying to play Metroid Prime um, and not knowing what the hell the button prompts were for, as it was for a GameCube controller, uh, which is an odd beast. So even if this game is creaky and a little bit strange, uh, the camera is a little bit strange. Um, it's very, very short. You get through it in half an hour. I think that's a hard sell for a lot of people. Um, it certainly shows its age, but it is an artifact of the Sega Saturn era. Um, I am really happy that this remake exists. I'm really happy that Panzer Dragoon, um, a somewhat legendary cult game series, is getting another life. I'm really, really excited to play Zwei when it comes out. You never know. We might get Orta. We might get Panzer Dragoon Saga. So all fingers crossed for that. Um, but this was a really fun, nostalgic blast for me. Um, I'm really happy that I played it. Um, this is often on deep sale, I will say. I've seen it for, I think, £4 or something on the Switch sale. So... Um, Forever Entertainment knows that if this game is cheap, then you know it might spark people's nostalgia. And for a half-hour game that is really fun and an artifact of video game history, I think it's a, a good pickup from the eShop. Um, that's Panzer Dragoon Remake. <laughs> So this was a bit of a different kind of episode this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I usually talk about games that have come out recently. Um, this got me thinking a little bit, actually, about the roots of this podcast, I guess. When I started this podcast, I had seven years of game history to catch up on. Um, and so the first hundred episodes or so are really quite all over the shop in terms of the kinds of games that I was talking about, the age of the games that I was talking about. But over time, I've kind of exhausted all those uh, game of the year 2017 and 2015 and 2013 lists. Um, I still do go and look at them sometimes and pick up the occasional game that I haven't heard of. Um, but as I have exhausted the back catalogue of things that I missed and the big heavy hitters, um, I have ended up leaning more into what's coming out, uh, looking ahead, uh, looking ahead to new indie games, looking ahead to new titles that are coming out. Um, and so the tone and the, the coverage of this podcast has changed over time. Um, to be more geared towards new releases. So it is actually really fun to me to just go and talk about an old game, talk about a classic game um, that connects to my own childhood and my own, my own gamer history. Um, it did give me a little buzz of why people do uh, look back and why there are people who use original hardware to play games that they remember and who like to collect physical copies. Um, I'm still not that kind of person, to be honest with you. Um, I don't have a physical collection, but it was a really fun little window to open. Um, and to look into 
um, and to play an old game again. So I hope that you enjoyed the episode. If you did, uh, feel free to let me know. I'm on Twitter at Gaming in the Wild. I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I'm also on YouTube. I've been posting the podcast as videos, a cut down version of just the reviews. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Please share the video with a friend. Um, If you're listening to the podcast, you can always leave a rating on Spotify, a review on iTunes, or send it to someone you know, or tweet it out or something. All of that is really, really helpful um, to help me get the word out about this podcast. You're also welcome to join the Patreon, of course. There's a link in the description for that. Um, But I'll be back next week with a new episode, probably about Dredge. So I hope you're looking forward to that one. Take care of yourselves and each other, and bye-bye for now.